Let's get going with the material. Uh, maybe briefly talk about what we did last week, where we were at. What did we do last week? Talk about compactness. Yeah, we finished up uh, path connectedness and then started compactness. And do we remember our definition of compactness? I told you it's probably the least intuitive definition we'll ever get in topology. It has something to do with the cover spaces. Something with the sub covers. Sub covers, something with covers, sub covers, something like that. <laughs> yeah. How do I know if a set is compact? Do you remember what a cover of a set is? No. Very well. So, if I got some set right Not here, A. No Notice that if I take this open set, and this open set, and this open set, and union those together, they cover A. Yeah. That, so these three sets, if we call this U1, U2, U3, then the question of sets U1, U2, U3 would be a cover of A. It's also an open cover of A. What's the difference between a cover and an open cover? An open cover is completely composed of open sets. So this is a cover of A, this is an open cover of A, and it's finite, so it's a finite open cover of A. Why do you care whether there, it's finite or not? Well, I'm just pointing out it's finite. Okay. So this is a finite open cover of A. With me? Mm -hmm. Okay. What did it mean for the set A to be compact? It meant that for any open cover of A you can conceive of, it has a finite subcover. Yeah. So you can pick infinitely many open sets you want. I don't know anything about the question. You randomly pick some collection of open sets that covers A. There could be infinitely many of them. It should be possible for me to choose finitely many of them and still cover A. If it's possible for me to do that, A is compact. If it's impossible for me to do that, A is not compact. Yeah? Can we go over a sub cover again? A sub cover is just, so let me add one more set here. So we have U1, U2, U3. Let's say I add U4. U4 right there. With me? So notice U1, U2, U3, U4 is an open cover of A. And if we got rid of U4, we'd still have a cover of A. So U1, U2, U3 together is a subcover of this. Can the entire thing be subcover of itself? Yeah, every, every open cover is a subcover of itself. But if you can remove some elements and still have a cover, that's also a subcover. But like U1 by itself is not a subcover because it Correct. doesn't cover all the things. Okay. Correct. So let's say that definition one more time. When do I know that A is compact? I know that A is compact if for any open cover you pick, I can find a finite subcover. So you can use infinitely many things to cover A, you can get as tricky as you want, use it as small as possible, it doesn't matter what you do. If A is compact, I should always be able to choose out finitely many of those things and still cover A. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the last thing we proved last time, I want to mention it because I think we're going to have to use it again today. So our very, very last proof at the end of last class was that if you have a closed subset of a compact set, it is also closed. Is that restricted? We'll, we'll re-pull that up when it comes up because it's still okay. weird to just talk about that and go away and bring it up again. If you have a closed subset, then your cover is also closed? No. If, so let's say that A is a closed set and it's a subset of C, which is compact, then A is also compact. I think is what it was. Okay. But 
x be a topological space, let D be compact in x. If C is closed in x, and C is a subset of D, then C is compact in x. Oh, okay. Well, that was the last thing we proved, but maybe we'll re-bring that up when we actually use it, because I don't think we're going to reference it until our very last proof. It's a ways away. Okay, so our next theorem then, first theorem of the day, is theorem 7.8. That's who it referred to. Let x be Hausdorff. X is a topological space that's Hausdorff. What does it mean for it to be Hausdorff? Hmm. There's two. Hausdorff is two neighbors, two neighbors of every of each other. Yeah. yeah, for any two points you pick in there, they have their own neighborhoods. Yeah. Okay. You remember what a neighborhood of a point is? Yeah. Yeah, it's an open interval. Right? Just an open set containing it. Not necessarily the interval. Oh. Because we're in topology in general. Just any open set containing a point is a neighborhood of that point. So if I've got two points in my topological space, they have their own open sets containing them with no overlap between those sets. Hausdorff. All right. So let X be Hausdorff and let A be a subset of X. Let A as a subset of X be compact. Then A is closed. So what am I proving? I'm proving that in a Hausdorff topological space, all our compact sets are also closed. So if your space is Hausdorff, then a compact set is also a closed set. That's what we're proving. Okay. Got any intuition for what we're doing? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, in the definition, you said the closed uh, cover has to be open sets, right? Yes, every open cover has a finite subcover. But the subcover doesn't have to be open? Subcover is the same set. Yeah, it would be open, okay. Yes. How does that make the A close then? Let's find out. That's what we gotta show. We gotta show that if A is compact, if every open cover of A has a finite subcover, then A is closed. That's what we're proving. Okay. All right. So let little x be some point in A complement. Now, if I'm going to show that A is closed, I'm going to show its complement's open. That's typically how we do this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. How am I going to show its complement is open? I'm going to show that for any point in there you choose, for any x in there, I can find an open set U containing x such that x is in U is a subset of A complement. And then by the union lemma, A complement is just all those U's. Same strategy we've yeah. used a hundred times. Is this ringing bells? Mm -hmm. Do we need to drop? No, no, I think we're good. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. So let X be some point in there. My job now is to find an open set containing X that's a subset of A complement. Once I do that, I'm done. So that's what I'm after from here on out. So let little x and a complement and observe that for all little a's in big A, there exists u sub a and v sub a. We're going to be using the fact that's Hausdorff. There exists u sub a and v sub a such that x is in u sub a, a is in v sub a, and their intersection is empty. So kind of a mouthful, let's say it again. I've got x at some point in a complement. Then for any other point, for any little a I choose in big A, I can find a neighborhood, two neighborhoods, one containing little a, one containing little x, with no intersection. Yeah. So why do you have a u sub a and a v sub a? That's the Pick a little a in big A. This is the name of my two sets that don't intersect. Oh, and X is in, okay. I see. Yeah, now I'll pick another little a. This is the name of those two sets. So we're naming, who knows? I mean, if a has 100 elements in it, then we're creating 100 pairs of open sets. Okay. So for all little a in big A, there exists two open sets such that X is in the first one, A is in the second one, and they have no intersection. What does that mean that your u sub a is not in a, right? That my use no. It's we don't know anything about that yet. 
U sub A could intersect big A. We don't know. All I know is that little a is not in U sub A. And x is not in A. And x is not in B sub A. And x, x is in U sub A, so it's not in B sub A. Mm -hmm. yeah. Little a is in B sub A, so it's not in U sub A. They said x is For a particular a. Oh yeah, x is in a complement, so x isn't in a. But this u sub a might intersect a at some point, and this b sub a might intersect a complement at some point. Okay. All I know is these point, this point is in here and for sure not in there. This point is in here and for sure not in there. Yeah. Okay. That's all I know. With me so far? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Now notice that. Well, let's let O equal all our B sub A's. So notice that my B sub little a was the open set containing little a, right? Oh, that would say open set little a. Perfect. So then big O equaling all my B sub little a's for every little a and big A is definitely going to cover all of big A, right? Yeah. 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 So then O defined this way is an open cover of big A. What do we know about big A? It's compact. It's compact. Let x be Hausdorff and let A as a subset of x be compact. So we know A is compact. So here's an open cover of A. A is compact. So then there must exist finitely many things, finitely many V's I can pull out of that set as a finite subcover. Call them VA1, VA2, all the way up to VAN. The point is there's only N of them. Mm -hmm. All right. Now remember that for each v a sub 1 or v a sub n, there's a corresponding u a sub n. Remember that for each v we had a u. Yeah. So there's a pairing here. Don't lose track of our u's. So let v equal the union of all my v a sub i's. So let big v be the union of all these things. Okay. Notice that these are a cover of A, so when I union them all up, I still have a cover of A. So V is a cover of A still. Mm -hmm. And let U equal the intersection of all my U's. So for each, for the U that was paired with this, 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 intersect those. Not union, intersect. You with me? Mm -hmm. So, V here is a union of a bunch of open sets. So V is still open, and we know it covers A. So v, A is a subset of V. U here is an intersection of finitely many open sets. So it's still open, right? Mm -hmm. And now, notice that since each V, each v sub AI and each U sub AI are disjoint, then, when I intersect all my u sub a sub i's, I'm taking all the things that weren't in, let, let's talk about one at a time. u sub a1 only contains points that aren't in v sub a1, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And u sub a2 only contains points that aren't in v sub a2. Mm -hmm. So when I intersect u sub a1 and u sub a2, I have points that aren't in V sub A1 and V sub A2. Yeah. Similarly, for all N. So, since this is defined as an intersection, notice that V intersect U is empty. They have no points in common. Yeah, I see that. Okay, so two important points here. U is open, because it's a finite intersection of open sets. Okay. And U does not intersect V. Therefore, is V still open? No. A is a subset of V. U does not intersect V, so U does not intersect A, so U is in A complement, and it's an open set containing X. Oh, okay. Remember what I told you we were going to do from the start. I said, we're going to take this X, we're trying to show that A complement is open. I said, how are we going to do that? I told you I was going to find a U 
such that x is in u and u is a subset of a complement. That was my whole goal, is to get that u. And that's the exact u that we found. So this u here is an open set. It has nothing in common with v. Since a is a subset of v, then u has nothing in common with a. Yeah. And if u has nothing in common with a, then it lies entirely in a complement. That's what we're going to say. So since a is a subset of v, then u is a subset of a complement. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Which gives me x is in u, and u is a subset of a complement. Therefore, a complement is open, which gives us a is closed. Do we need a How do you know a complement is open? I just barely showed that for any x in a complement you choose, I can find an open set u containing x where u is also a subset of a complement. Union up all those u's and you get a complement. Gotcha. The union lemma. I didn't explicitly yeah, write that. If you were, would say let for all of x in a complement. Well, we want to start with a particular x. And show that one? Yeah, we want to show for a particular x you choose, here's how you do it. But it stands for because, x, right? Kind of. We, we do this for a particular... So I could have written one more step here. 7, then by the union lemma, uh, a complement is open. I'm using the union lemma without saying it. The reason that would be dangerous for me to put up for all here is because notice that for a particular x, you're doing that for all a to define your view. And you wouldn't be able to do for all a if that was the case? Well, now that gets just well, confusing. You for every x. Yeah, you you're, for all a. Your, term, your writing is going to get real messy. Because once you pick an x, I need to go through all a. I'm still not seeing it. <laughs> OK. Uh, if it still makes sense for you to put a for all x in there, then that is perfectly fine. Okay. Because this is true for every x you pick in there. We just started with an arbitrary x in there, showed how to get the u. Therefore, you can do that for any for all x in there. It's just our union lemma was that if for any x you can find the u containing it, that's a subset, then you're done. And then union of all those u's. The union lemma finishes it for us. So you could reprove the union lemma if you want. I could have called this u instead of that. I could have called it u sub x. Then I could have unioned up all those u sub x's for every x in a complement, and then did it that way. Okay. That's perfectly fine. It would just be redoing the work that we did proving the union lemma. Anyways, but I think you get the proof, right? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Okay, so let's get to our next lemma. This one's kind of a weird one. It's called the tube lemma, and you'll see why it's called the tube lemma. Uh, here's how it works. Okay, uh, let's just say what we're proving with the picture first, and then we'll read it. Okay, so I've got a topological space X and a topological space Y. This square is our cross product topological space. With me so far? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I am going to show that if Y over here is compact, then if y over here is compact and little x is any point in big X, then, what's the best way to say this? Then for any open set U containing little x cross y, so that's this line. So this line right here is little x cross y, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what are we saying? What are we going to prove? I'm going to prove that for any u in x, y, for any open set u, you can find an x cross y that happens to contain this vertical line. Then there is also an open set w in x such that it cross with y is also in u. So if u contains this vertical line, then there's also going to be this tube that u contains, which is w cross y. So if it contains x, this point x cross y, which is this vertical line, then it's also going to contain for some w, w, it's also going to contain w cross y. I think I see what you're getting at. 
You see it? Okay, so let's read it now without the picture. Uh, oh, this was stuff from before, so we know that. Let x, y be a topological space such that y is compact. If little x and big x, so if little x is some point in big x, that point down there, and u is open in x cross y, u is this ball, if u is open in x cross y, such that u contains little x cross y, u contains that vertical line, then there exists some w that is open in x, such that little x is in w, and w cross y is a subset of u. It does seem strange. And it's just a lemma to help us with our main proof. So this is just going to help us with the proof that if x and y are compact topological spaces, then so is x cross y, which is very useful to know. Whoa. So this is just a side lemma to help us prove this main theorem. Wouldn't, wouldn't you just be able to be x by itself? U is in x cross y. So it can't be just x. x isn't in x cross y. No, sorry. And can it just be little x cross y? Just that, that, uh... N no. Not unless the set containing little x by itself is open in x. Then it could be. And then the open set w would be the set just containing x as well. Oh. So in this case, they'd be equal. Okay. So, yeah, this is gone. Let's uh, prove this lemma. So, let little x be any point in big X, and let u be any open set in x cross y, such that little x cross y is a subset of u. So, we pick some little x over here, and we pick some u in x cross y containing this vertical line. Good? Yep. Okay. Then, for any little y and big y, let w sub y, let w sub y be open in x and v sub y be open in y such that their cross product contains the point x cross xy. So notice x is already cho chosen here, right? Mm -hmm. So we're saying Pick any y you want out of here, any little y you want. Here's little y. So the point x cross little y is this point right here, right? Mm -hmm. Notice that for any little y you choose, here's a corresponding point, there has to be two open sets, one open in x, one open one in y, such that their cross product contains that point. They could be basis elements, but they might be bigger. Okay. You with me on what this is saying? Okay, then notice that all these d sub y's are going to give me an open cover of y. Let's say it again. For any little y you choose, then there exists open sets. Over here we have w sub y. Oh, this one's v sub y. And then w sub y somewhere down here, such that v sub y cross w sub y contains that point. Mm -hmm. Right? That was for any y you choose. So if you choose this y, then we can find them contain this point. If you choose this y, for this y, this, 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 any y you choose. Then that v sub y, there's going to be a v sub y, an open set containing that point. So all those v sub y's are an open cover of y. All of them together? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, not each individual one is an open cover of y. An open cover has to be a set of sets. The set of all v sub y for every little y and big y is an open cover of y, and so has to have a finite subcover called v y1, v y2, all the way up to v y n. Mm -hmm. You with me? So all those V's cover Y. 
Now, let big W equal the intersection of all my W sub y's. Now, W sub y was an open set in X containing little x, right? Yeah. So my VY sub 1 might have been this set. My VY sub 2 might have been this set. My, or my WY okay. sub 1, WY sub 2, WY sub 3, WY sub 4, WY sub 5, whatever they all are. Mm -hmm. It's just a bunch of set open sets in X, but notice that they kept containing little x. Yeah. So let W equal the intersection of all those W's, the W sub Y's. And note that x is always in that w, and that w is open. The w is open because it's equal to a finite intersection of open sets. And since each of those contain little x, then x is in the intersection of all of those. Yeah. So for any v w sub y you pick here, w would now be a subset of that thing. Right? w is what was in every single one of those. It's the intersection of all of them. Yeah. Where does that leave the x there? Not necessarily. Because it could have been other points. There could have been a bunch of points that were in the intersection of all of them. It can't be just x. If, the x, if this space over here, for example, were the standard topology on R, so if x were R and this were the standard topology, the W couldn't be just X because it's an intersection of open sets containing that point. An open set has to be basically an open interval. Mm -hmm. So in that case, it would be an open interval containing X. And you said W was a subset of all of the dub, uh, W sub Ys? It's the intersection of them. W is equal to the intersection of all our W, Y, Is. So it's a subset of so it's a subset of their intersection. So it's a subset, it's equal to their intersection, so it's a subset of each individual one. What is the intersection of a bunch of sets? It's the elements that showed up in every single one. So W has all the elements that were in WY1. It has, sorry, all the elements in W were in WY1 and in WY2 and in WY3 and in WY4, all the way up to WYN. So it's a subset of each of them. It's a subset of each of those WY sub i's. Yes. Okay. That is correct. Wonderful. So note, W, it's equal to their intersection. Since they're all open sets, W is open and X is in W. So the crux of it is what I was going to say here. So the W cross Y is a subset of the union of all the wy sub i's cross the v sub y sub i's. Here's how you make sense of that. w is a subset of the union of all these things, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the union of all these things is an open cover of y. Wait, w isn't a union of those? It's an intersection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. w is the intersection of all these things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, W is a subset of each of those things. And so it's definitely a subset of the union of all those things. Mm -hmm. Y, or let's look at the V's. These V's are an open cover of Y. So the union of all the V's gives you Y. So Y is a subset of the union of all these things. W is a subset of each of those things, so definitely of the union of those things. So this set, W cross Y, is a subset of the union of each of these. Do you follow that? Yep. Yeah. Okay. That's the hard part. And then these are a subset of U. How are they a subset of U? Uh, by definition... is a subset of U. Oh my, wow. Did I really not do that? I'm choosing. So U is an open set in X cross Y. Mm -hmm. X, Y is a point in U. 
And so there has to be open sets in X and Y such that the cross product contains it and it's a subset of U. Potentially basis elements. Yeah. Sorry, that's a huge step to not write. So what we're saying is, pick any point in here you want. I know that U is an open set containing it. I should be able to find some set in X, doesn't matter how small, some set down here in X and some set in here in Y, such that their cross product contains a point and we're still a subset of U. U is open in this cross product space, so it has to be a union of basis elements. Why does it have to be a union of basis elements? That's what a basis is. A basis generates your open sets. Let's go back to our talking about a basis. No, no, I understand that. So did you misunderstand? I might have said it wrong. I'm saying these could potentially, these are at least basis elements, maybe bigger open sets. So I'm guaranteed that there are some open sets, one open in X, one open in Y, such that the cross prop contains that point, and we're still a subset of U. Okay, I see. Now. One way to say that is, U is an open set, this is a point in U, Therefore, there has to be some basis element containing this point that's still a subset of U. Mm -hmm. That makes sense now? Okay, so that's how we know that these are a subset. Where were we? That's how we know that union those all up, we're still a subset of U. Union up a bunch of subsets of U, still a subset of U. Good? Yep. Okay. So then, x is in w, w is open, and w cross y is a subset of u. That's what we were after. Seems. Let's go over this again one more time. Let x and y be topological spaces such that y is compact. If little x is in big X and u is an open set in x cross y, such that the set containing x cross y is a subset of u, then there exists some w, open in x such that little x is in w, and w cross y is a subset of u. So we were trying to show x is in w, w is open in x, mm -hmm. and w cross y is a subset of u. Those were the three things we were trying to show. Okay. Good? Really, seems like a really weird lemma, but it's just a lemma for this main curve. This main curve is the real thing we're interested in. Okay, so I think the main proof is a lot more straightforward, why it's useful, and why we're going to do it. If x and y are, com are compact topological spaces, then so is x cross y. That's what we want to show. Cross product of com compact spaces is still compact. Alright, so let x, y be compact topological spaces. Uh, I, we go a little bit this way, so maybe move my camera. So if x and y are compact topological spaces, and so is a cross product. Let x and y be compact topological spaces, and let O be any open cover of x cross y. What is my goal? My goal is to find a finite subcover of O. In the cross product. Yes, in the cross product of That's it? Yeah. If I can, what does it mean for it to be compact? It means for any open cover, there exists a finite subcover. Yes. So. Let O be any open cover of X cross Y. My job is to find a finite subcover that still covers X cross Y. Okay, and then we're done. All right. So since Y is compact, then for each, then for all little X in big X, there exist O X, O sub X, such that O sub X is a finite subcover of little x cross y. Let's say that again. Big O is an open cover of all of x cross y. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. So big O definitely covers little x cross y. Yes. 
And if it covers all of x cross y, it definitely covers just little x cross y, that little vertical line, yeah. right? Now, little x cross y is homeomorphic to just y, right? If I take all y and I just cross it with an element, it's still homeomorphic to y. No? What does that mean again? It's the same topological space, or topologically equivalent. Oh. If I take all your elements in topology, and for each a, I just rewrite it as a comma one, I didn't really change anything. I just relabeled all your points, and instead of just calling them a, I called it parenthesis a comma one. I just made them all look different. My open sets are still my same open sets. It's just now instead of an open set containing a, b, c, it contains a comma one, b comma one, c comma one. Right? Okay. I think my homeomorphism is map a to parenthesis a comma one and parenthesis. That's one to one onto bijective open sets are going to be preserved. So little so y big y the whole topological space y is homeomorphic to little x cross y. Does that make sense? Okay, so little x cross y is going to be compact since y is compact. Since y is compact and y and little x cross y are homeomorphic, then little x cross y is compact. Mm -hmm. Okay, so big O covers all of x cross y, so big O definitely covers little x cross y. Yeah. So there has to be a finite subcover of big O that covers little x cross y, call it O sub x. Yeah. Okay. So O sub x is a finite subcover of this thing, which still covers this. Good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let U sub x be the union of all of O sub x. Oh. O sub x is a collection of open sets whose union contains this. Yeah. Let u sub x be the union of all those sets, and note that u sub x is open, mm -hmm. and it's also going to contain this whole set. Yeah. So u sub x is an open set that contains little x cross y. Mm -hmm. From our lemma now, notice that if little x is in big X and u, in our case we have u sub x, is open in x cross y such that little x cross y is a subset of u sub x, then there's going to exist w sub x open in x such that x is in w sub x and w sub x cross y is a subset of u sub x. And this is going to be true for every u sub x that we choose. So we're going to be using this limit. So let u sub x be the union of o sub x, and note it's open. So then there exists w sub x, such that little x is in w sub x, w sub x is open in x, and w, x, w sub x cross y is a subset of u sub x. Mm -hmm. That's just using our tube lemma. Then o sub x is an open cover of w x cross y. Wx cross y is a subset of u sub x. u sub x is the union of all of o sub x. So o sub x covers wx or w sub x cross y. Let's say that one more time. u sub x is the union of all of o sub x. Yeah. W sub x cross y is a subset of u sub x. So W sub x cross y is a subset of the union of O sub x. Yeah. So W sub x cross y is covered by O sub x. Mm -hmm. So O sub x is a cover, an open cover, of W sub x cross y. With me? Okay, now let P equal all the W sub X's that we can get. Okay, yeah. I see that. Okay, 
and observe that P covers X. W sub X is an open set in X, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And for each little X in big X, you have a corresponding WX. Okay. So take all those WX's, it's going to cover X. Yep, I see that. Okay, so P is an open cover of X, which means there's a finite subcover of X. Mm -hmm. WX1, WX2, WXN is my finite subcover of X. With me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, no, remember that for each of these WX elements, we had a corresponding open cover O sub X. A corresponding O sub X. Which covered W, so for example, I know now that O sub X1 covers W sub X1 cross Y. Yeah. Same with O sub X2 all the way to O sub Xn. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. So I need this union those together. Exactly. So let C be the union of all those open covers. Now notice that each one of these was finite. Yeah. Right? Each O sub X1 was finite. So when we union them all together, we're taking a union of finitely many things which had finitely many elements in it. Yeah. So C is going to be my finite open cover of the whole set mm -hmm. when I union all these up. So let C be the union of all those O sub X's and observe that C covers X cross Y. Every, so O sub X1 covered WX1 cross Y, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So every O sub X covers all of Y. Now we just need to keep doing that for all the X's. Yeah. And that's what you do. And that's what we do. We do, first we start with WX1, then WX2, WX3, and we keep doing it, and eventually we do it for all of X. Mm -hmm. So all the O sub X's that we chose cover x cross y. So c equal to the union is going to cover x cross y. You yeah. see that? So I see it. Are you finished then? Because you said that has a finite. Well, I, we just need to specify what I set up here. So since each O sub x was finite, and since c was a finite union, then c is a finite cover. Oh. And then since c is a subset of O, we only made it up out of elements that ultimately came from O, then it's a finite subcover of O, and therefore, X cross Y is compact. Okay. Follow that? Yeah. That one was a mouthful. But that ends that section, and now we are on to the next section, which is compactness in metric spaces. Well, don't we have that last corollary? Oh, yeah, that last corollary, which is... Just saying, now we can do this proof by induction, since we did the base case, to finish the job. I think mine's covering it. Okay, good catch. So our final corollary, let x1, x2, xn be topological spaces, and let a sub i be a subset of x sub i, such that a sub i is compact. Then now the cross product of n compact Spaces is still yeah. is still going to be compact in the cross top topological spaces. So obviously the hard part is proving your base case. The proof by induction is easy because the cross product of k sets is still just a set. So it's a set cross with a set for k plus one, which yeah. is still just cross product between two sets. Mm -hmm. So the proof by induction you basically get for free. Can we go over what metric spaces are before we get into it? Yes, metric spaces. What is a metric space? A metric space is a set together with a metric function. What was a metric function? Something that measured like distance? That's intuitively what we think. It measures distance. So it's a function that, so if we've got, if D is a metric on some set X, 
then d is a function from x cross x to r. So you give it two things out of x, and it gives you the distance between them, satisfying some properties. One, it only spits out zero or a positive number. It can't spit out negatives. No notion of negative distance. Two, it only spits out zero if the two points you gave it were the exact same point. So if the distance between two points is zero, they have to be the same point, otherwise it's not a metric. And there can be spaces that aren't met metric. Like, I, I mean obviously, but can you give an example of one? Uh, pick any random topological space you want. It's not necessarily a metric space. Uh, a metric is a very specific function that satisfies these rules. You're thinking about 3D space where you can use the Euclidean metric. Think about the point. Here's my set. Okay, give me my metric function on there. Uh, I don't know. Right, you have to come up with one in order to somehow make this a metric space. Okay. You see? So, a metric is more structured, something that you get. Just like a probability function for a sample space. That makes more sense. So why do we care about compactness in these spaces? Well, we're going to see... <laughs> so first off, a metric space is a space with a lot of structure. We already saw that if you have a metric space, you have a topological space. You get a topological space for free when you have a metric space. We're also going to see that if you have a metric space, then your spaces that are compact, or your sets are compact, have some nice properties. So what's the first thing that we're going to show? Well, not that. That's a calculus result. We're going to show that every closed and bounded interval is compact in R with the standard topology. So we're going to show that you guys haven't done calculus yet. Uh, when you take calculus and someone talks about a compact set to you, you're going to think about that as a closed interval AB. When we were coming up, when topologists were coming up with a notion, trying to come up with a definition of compactness. No. They need, one of the things that they were checking, as they're trying to find this definition and look for how it generalizes to all these different use cases, one of the use cases they needed it to cover is on the standard topology on R, it needs to be this. So they were coming up with some high level abstraction that gives us a lot of things, and when we're in the standard topology on R, it still just gives us this, because calculus was developed before topology. And so what we had as a notion of a compact set in calculus, we still needed to have be the case. Right. So, all we're going to do is see what, if you know your topological space is also a metric space, what extra information does I give you for free about the compact sets in there? That's what we're going to be looking at this section. That's probably the easiest way to say it. And this section is... Uh, very much, this section and the next section, our last two sections, are very much uh, dipping your toe into calculus, real analysis. We're getting to things that you can tell about compact sets when you're talking about on the real numbers with the standard topology. So, you'll notice that that's a lot of what we talked about from here on out. Okay. So, yeah, this class and next class are going to be a lot like a just a calculus class, a real analysis class. I call it calculus because that's what I call it when I teach at the academy. Anyways, so a metric function gives you the distance between two points. The distance can only be zero if the points are the exact same points. Furthermore, it has to satisfy the triangle inequality. The distance from A to B plus the distance from B to C has to be less than or equal to the distance from A to C. In other words, if I'm trying to get from me to Peter, there can't be some weird off course I can get that shorter than just going straight to you. It can't be faster for some reason to go to New York City and then go to Peter rather than just go straight to Peter. Otherwise, it's not a metric. Okay, you're saying each line has to be less than, right? The distance from A to B plus the distance from B to C has to be less than or equal to the distance from A to C. Let me write into my proof. Uh, where can we write? I wanted off my board. 
the distance from A to B plus the distance from B to C has to be less than or equal to the distance from A to C. It's called the triangle inequality because one intuitive notion of it when we're thinking about the Euclidean metric is this reduces to you can't have one side of a triangle longer than the sum of the other two sides. It's impossible to draw a triangle so that one side is longer than the other two sides added together. But isn't that what that's saying? That is what this is saying. Is that A to C is longer than those two sides together? Thank you. Oh my goodness. I kept writing my inequality backwards. Okay. Greater than or equal <laughs> to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like, isn't that the Can't believe they let me write that that many times. Yes, thank you. The distance from A to B plus the distance from B to C has to be greater than or equal to the distance from A to C. The okay. shortest path between me and Peter is straight to Peter. I can't go to Leah then to Peter and make yes, it shorter. That only makes it longer. Okay. So I was saying that wrong the whole time, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I didn't realize that. I was saying it right in my head, wrong out loud. Just make sure, for sure, for sure, draw any triangle you want. It is impossible for me to make this side longer than the sum of these two sides. Yeah. Okay. That's why it's called the triangle inequality. That's the first way it showed up in regular geometry. That's something you prove in standard Euclidean geometry. Can you prove that? Yes. Okay. Okay. So now... Uh, our next proof. The nested interval theorem. Alright. So let the set, so we've got this set of closed bounded intervals in the real numbers. So we're talking about an R. You know what A to B is when you use closed brackets in R, right? Mm -hmm. It's a closed bounded interval. Okay, so I'm creating now a set of closed bounded intervals, infinitely many of them. So for all n in the positive integers. So we have in here a1 to b1, then we have a2 to b2, then we have a3 to b3. So we have a bunch of random closed intervals in R. And we're going to give them a special property. So let this be a set of closed bounded intervals in R such that a n plus 1 to b n plus 1 is always a subset of the previous set a n to b n. So we're saying that, for example, a 2 comma b 2 is a subset of a 1 comma b 1. And a 3 b 3 is a subset of that. And then a 4 b 4 is a subset of a 3 b 3. So we start out with some closed bounded interval, a 1 b 1. And we keep taking subsets of it that are still closed bounded intervals. And we might jump around weird, who knows, but we can we always have to stay inside the previous one. So it's always getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Or just staying the same. If it stayed the same, we could have infinitely many, all the exact same, staying the same. Gotcha. Okay? But they're nested. That's what we mean by nested. We mean the next one is always a subset of the previous one. That's what we mean by nested. They're always nested inside each other. You think you understand what this set looks like? Yeah. Just nested intervals inside of each other. Infinitely yeah. many. Good? Okay. What are we going to show? We're going to show that their intersection of all infinitely many of them is non-empty. So they're all separated from each other. No. Take the in, there's going to be a point that's in all of them. So I keep taking nested intervals, and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and smaller. But no matter how small I get, I still have to have one point in there. Yeah. So we might start out with this interval. Here's a1, b1, right? Is it because it's on the integers that you can see that? It's not on the integers. This is the real numbers. 
we're just saying for all n and z positive, meaning we're going to have a1 to b1, then a2 to b2, then a3 to b3. Oh. So here is a1, here's b1. But I thought whatever integer or interval that you make, there's infinite degrees going to it. There is. So here is a1, b1. Now, our next one is a2, b2. We don't know anything about a2, b2, except for it's a subset of a1, b1. So a2, b2 might be this. a2 might be right here. b2 might be in the same exact spot as b1. So now, here was a1, b1. Now here's a2, b2. Mm -hmm. And a3, b3, a4, b4, a5, b5, a6, b6. And then from there on out, might be the exact same interval to infinity. Doesn't that mean they're always slowly collapsing on one point? You don't know the point, but it's always collapsing. If they keep getting closer and closer and closer, then they have to collapse on one point. Okay. But they don't necessarily have to keep getting closer and closer and closer. They could just get to a point and stop. And that's still a subset of itself. And just do that infinitely many times, the exact same set. How do you know there will always be a point in all of that? We're proving that. Yeah, but can't... So, so let's say that I get a3, b3 here. Here's a3, here's b3. Now they're really close, right? So now I know that a4, b4 has to be inside of that. It can't be over here, and it can't be over here. It has to be inside of it. And a5, b5 has to be inside of a4, b4, etc., etc., etc. Yeah, but can't you just, like, in a sense, just keep zooming up, like, forever, infinitely? Yeah, you can. Then how, then... We don't have like one point that we know of. We're not saying only one point. We're saying there is a point that's an all one. I still don't see how that's possible. All right, let's pick a particular set and show how it zooms in. I'll just erase some of this. We don't need the corollary. Let's do a particular set. So I'm going to do a. Uh, I'm going to do we'll do one over n comma two. So there's how I'm going to create my infinitely many intervals. So what's my first interval? My first interval is one. Oh shoot, that doesn't work. That's going the wrong way, huh? Yeah, it's going further and further to the left. So I want something like this. Let's do a negative 1 to 1 over n. Okay, here's what my nested intervals are going to look like. So a1, b1 is negative 1 to 1. It's what you get when you plug 1 in there. a2, b2 is negative 1, 1 half. a3, b3 is negative 1, 1 third. Saying negative, one would be that one. negative 1 is always a1, but notice that b1 is 1, b2 is 1 half, b3 is 1 third. To infinity, no matter how far you do this, you're always going to contain the interval negative 1 to 0. This is going to be in every single one of those. No matter how big this n gets, this is always in every single one of those. Okay, but what if in the scenario where you just pick the point and then you progressively go from there? Hold on. Keep with this one for a second. You see how these points are in every single one of those? Yes. So, not only is there a point, but there's infinitely many points in all of them. So the infinite intersection of all these is going to be this exact set. You with me? Okay, now let's do one like what you're saying. Let's do negative 1 over n to 1 over n. Notice that 0 is going to be in every single one of those. And the distance between these goes to 0. We start out with negative 1 to 1. Then we get negative 1 half to 1 half. Dot, dot, dot. Eventually you got negative 1 over 100 to 1 over 100. Da, da, da. Do this to infinity. Zero is always going to be in those, because no matter how big n is, that's still negative. No matter how big n is, this is still positive. So zero is between them. 
But notice that no other number satisfies that. Because if you were to pick something like, well, is it point oh 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 one always in there? No. Pick n to be 10 trillion. 1 over 10 trillion is less than that. So 0 is in the intersection of those. So if we take the intersection from n equals 1 to infinity, 0 is still in there. Mm -hmm. And that's a case where they approach each other, a nested interval where it keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. We still have at least one point that's always in there. So I showed you an example where infinitely many points were always in there. And I showed you a case where exactly one point was always in there. We're proving that it doesn't matter what these nested intervals do, as long as it's nested intervals, there's always at least one point in there. And that's what we're proving. Okay. Is it appealing to the intuition? Oh, we're proving it. Yes, that's what we're going to prove. That is what the nested interval theorem is. The nested interval theorem is, is if you have some nested intervals, infinitely many nested intervals, then take the intersection of all infinitely many of them, and you're still going to have something in there. It's going to be non-empty. So the intersection of all infinitely many of these is going to be non-empty. In this case, it's going to be equal to the set containing zero. Or the way that we're going to write it in our proof is zero, zero. Remember that zero, zero is defined to be just a set containing zero. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right? Okay. So let's get started. Assume that the interval a sub n plus 1 to b sub n plus 1 is a subset of a and b n for all n and z plus. Assume we have nested intervals. With me so far? Mm -hmm. Okay. Then notice that as our A's and B's go in on each other, our B's can only get smaller and our A's can only get bigger. They can stay the same. Our A's can either stay the same or get bigger, and our B's can either stay the same or get smaller. If we have nested intervals, right? Yeah. yeah. So that's what's in here. Then a1 is less than or equal to a2 is less than or equal to blah, 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 blah. Less than or equal to a n is less than or equal to blah, 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 blah. Is less than or equal to, now we get to our first, now we get to our b's, b n, less than or equal to, less than or equal to b2, less than or equal to b1. Right? Okay. I'm just pointing that out. Make sure you understand that that's what's happening. So, now I'm going to take all these a1, a2, a3, an's, all infinitely many of them, and put them in a set. So we're looking at the set a sub n for all n in the positive integers, which is a set of real numbers. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. Now notice that all of these a's are less than or equal to some number, namely b1. Yeah. All infinitely of our a's never get bigger than a number, for example, b1. So they're bounded from above by a number, namely b1. They're also bounded above from by b2. They're also bounded from above by b3. I'm just picking some number. So since our set of a sub n's is bounded from above, namely by b1, then it has a least upper bound, call it a. That is an axiom of the real numbers. Every set of real numbers bounded from above has a least upper bound. What's a least upper bound again? It is an upper bound of a sub n. So since a is an upper bound of a sub n, then it's greater than or equal to every a sub n. So that's an upper bound. Mm -hmm. Now notice a sub n has tons of upper bounds. b sub n is an upper bound of it. b sub 2 is an upper bound of it. b sub 1 is an upper bound of it. B sub 1 plus 97 is an upper bound of it. It has infinitely many upper, upper bounds. A is its least upper bound. So A is still an upper bound, but it's the smallest number that is still an upper bound. Okay. So in other words, since I know that B sub 2 is an upper bound, and I know that A is the least upper bound, I know A is less than or equal to B sub 2, because A is the least upper bound. Big A is the least upper bound of all our little A sub n's. Okay. You follow that? Mm -hmm. 
And then similarly, since our bands are bounded from below, they have a greatest lower bound. Call it big B. So you look at all the lower bounds of B sub n, it's going to have a greatest lower bound. So all our upper bounds of A sub n, you have a least upper bound. All our lower bounds of B sub n, you have a greatest lower bound. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then finally notice that uh, since all our B's are greater than our A's, then my least upper bound of my A's has to be less than or equal to my greatest lower bound of my B's. And they can be the same form. They can be the same. But in your implication, it says that there, there's something inside of them. Since A is less than or equal to B, then the in closed interval AB has something in it. Notice 0 to 0 has what in it? Oh, 0. Mm -hmm. So in the case that we have here, 0 was both the least upper bound. 0 is the least upper bound of negative 1 sub n. And it's the greatest lower bound of 1 sub n. So 0 in this case is acting as both the A and the B. Gotcha. When we had the case, what did we do before? We did negative 1 to 1 over n. Yeah. In this case, my least upper bound of all my left-hand points, since my left-hand point is always negative 1, negative 1, negative 1, negative. the least upper bound is just negative 1. My greatest lower bound is 0, is zero for all the right-hand elements. Okay, I think you got good intuition for what we're talking about there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So since A is less than or equal to B, then the closed interval AB is not empty. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. All that remains to show then is that the intersection of all my closed intervals is that interval big A to big B. Because ultimately, what am I trying to show? I'm trying to show that the intersection of all my intervals is not empty. I know that big A to big B is not empty. So if the intersection of all my intervals is big A to big B, then it's not empty. Are you done? No, I mean it remains to show this. I'm going to move on and show it. Oh. I just want to make sure that you understand why now showing this and we're done. Mm -hmm. Okay. That way you don't get lost in why we're showing one set's a subset of another and then the other is a subset of the one. So from here on out, I'm going to show it. This is a subset of this and this is a subset of this. So they're equal, so we're done. Okay. So let's do that. Okay, so how do you show that one subset a subset of the one set is a subset of the other? Grab a random element in one, show that it implies it's in the other. Mm -hmm. That's what we're gonna do back and forth. So let little x be in the intersection of all the intervals. Yeah. Now if little x is in the intersection of all the intervals, then little x is always greater than or equal to little a sub n, and little x is always less than or equal to b sub n. It's always between them for any n that you choose. Does that make sense? Yeah, I see. Okay, so if little x is always greater than or equal to a sub n, then little x is an upper bound of our a sub n's. What was big A? It's the least upper bound. x is an upper bound. Big A is a least upper bound, therefore, little x is big greater than or equal to big A. Similarly, since x is less than or equal to all our b sub n's, then x is a lower bound for b sub n. Capital B was, big B was our greatest lower bound, little x is a lower bound, therefore, little x is less than or equal to B. Which gives me x is inside that interval. Yeah. Which gives me that this is a subset of this. Okay. Do you follow that one? Yeah. Good. Okay. Now we're going to do almost the exact same thinking. Next, let little x in a b. What does that mean? That means little x is between the least upper bound of all of a n and the greatest lower bound of all of b n. So if x is greater than or equal to 
the least upper bound of all of an, then x has to be greater than all of an, greater than or equal to all of an. Similarly, if x is less than or equal to the least upper bound of bn, then x has to be, or is the greatest lower bound of bn, sorry, x is less than or equal to the greatest lower bound of bn. So we know that b is smaller than or equal to all the bn's. We know that x is smaller than or equal to b, therefore x is smaller than or equal to all the bn's. Yeah. You see that? Yeah, I do. Okay, so if x is always sandwiched between them, then that means x is in all of them. Yep. So, the closed interval, big A to big B, is a subset of the intersection of all of them, therefore they're equal, and we're done. Follow that? Yep. Okay. Next theorem. Is that some long proofs? Yeah. Some long proofs and no examples yet. We get bombarded with examples right after the last proof I have for us. So, really didn't split up well. Uh, make sure that I can see all that and all that. Okay. Now, the calculus result we're interested in. The calculus result we're interested in is that every closed and bounded interval, AB, is compact in R with a certain topology. So we're proving that any interval like this that you choose is compact. Okay, which is something we use in calculus all the time. The fact that closed bounded intervals are compact. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're going to prove. So let the closed bounded interval AB be a subset of R, and let big O be an open cover. What are we trying to do? We're trying to find a finite subcover of big O. We need to pick out finitely many things from there that still cover this, and we're done. Yeah. Good? Okay. This one's a weird one because we're doing this proof by contradiction. So, assume by way of contradiction that no finite subcover of big O exists. Mm -hmm. So, let's assume by way of contradiction that you always have to use infinitely many open sets that for any open cover that covers this thing, it never has a finite subcover. So pick some open cover. We're assuming it doesn't have a finite subcover. So anything that still covers this has to use infinitely many elements. Yeah. You with me? Okay. Now we're going to create a sequence of nested intervals. Here's how I'm going to create that sequence of nested intervals. We'll explain it with a picture and then we'll go from there. So here's my A, B. Need to fix that. We have plenty of time that we can show it. So here is my A, B. Okay? Okay. I'm going to call A, B, I'm also going to call it A1, B1, because we're going to create a sequence of nested intervals. So I'm also going to call it A1, B1. It's going to be my first one. And I'm going to create a sub-interval of this thing called A2, B2. I'm going to split it in half and call the half A2, B2. So pick the middle point. The middle point of A and B is what? How do you find the middle between two points? What's the middle of 5 and 15? 10. 10. How'd you do that? Add them, divide by 2. Add them, divide by 2. A plus B over 2 is always its midpoint. Yeah. Okay. Good? Okay. So now, remember that we are assuming that you have to use infinitely many open sets to cover this whole thing, right? Yeah. Which means that you either have to use infinitely many open sets to cover this half, or you have to use infinitely many, many open sets to cover this half. Yeah. Look, if, over that again. So I know that it takes infinitely many things, infinitely many open sets to cover this whole thing, right? Mm -hmm. Now, assume that I can cover this half with finitely many of them, and this half with finitely many of them. Then I can cover the whole thing with finitely many of them, right? Yeah. So if it takes infinitely many to cover the whole thing, then it has to take infinitely many to cover either this half or this half. Yeah. Okay. 
So maybe it takes infinitely many to cover both halves. I don't know. I know it takes infinitely many to cover at least one of the halves. Mm -hmm. Right? So take whichever half that is. I don't know what it is. Let's pretend it was this half. OK. So call that half A2, B2. With me? Yeah. Now split A2, B2 in half. Here's A2 plus B2 over 2. Right? And you just keep doing that? Same thing. Yep. Repeat and repeat right above. So you see how this is going to give me a nested intervals? Yeah. Because I'm going to keep splitting in half. Right? Mm -hmm. And notice, what was the size of my first interval? How long is this? Infinite. No, this is B minus A. This interval is B minus A, right? Yeah. So B1 minus A1 was equal to B minus A. B2 minus A2 was equal to B minus A over 2, right? Yeah. Now let's pretend that, okay, we went and we chose this half, so here's A3, B3. And then let's pretend that we chose this half, so here's A4, B4. Just like we can see this coming together. So notice, what is the size of B3 equal to then? It's A2 minus, or B2 minus A2 minus. But tell me in terms of B and A. B minus A over 4. Perfect. Now tell me this distance. B4 minus A4. How long is my fourth interval? B minus A over A. Perfect. And in general, what you're getting to know from this proof is that B to the N minus A to the N is equal to B minus A over 2 to the N minus 1. B to N minus 1. Okay. Right? For the first interval, we didn't have to divide it in half. For the second interval, we had to divide it in half once. For the third interval, we had to divide it in half twice. For the fourth interval, we had to divide it in half three times. For the nth interval, we had to divide it in half n minus one times. Okay. Okay. Now, we're going to keep doing this, keep doing this, keep doing this. How small is this distance going to get? Infinitely many, small, infinitely many small. This distance can get as small as we want, right? Mm -hmm. And we know that no matter how small you make this, then the interval a to the n and b to the n is never empty, right? We know that no matter how small you make that, you still didn't make it empty. That's our previous lemma. Yeah. Right? So, however small you make it, there's always going to be an x I can find inside of there. Yeah. And that x inside of there has to have a basis element which contains it. It has to have an open set in our cover which contains it. So, for any x in there, there has to be a u sub x that contains it. So, x is in u sub x. And if x is in an open set, x has to be in some open ball in that open set, right? Mm -hmm. So there's going to have to be an open ball, x minus epsilon, x plus epsilon, for some value epsilon. That's a subset of u sub x. So I'm going to keep making these smaller and smaller and smaller until we talk about a really, really small distance, okay? I'm going to find an open set covering x that happens to cover that entire distance. And if I find one open set that covers that entire distance, that's our contradiction. Because we are assuming it takes infinitely many to cover it. Oh, yeah. it Remember does. where we started. Yeah. We said pick the half that takes infinitely many to cover. Pick the half that takes infinitely many to cover. Pick the half that takes infinitely many to cover. We can keep making that half smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And smaller. Eventually, we're going to make it so small that fits inside just one open set in our open cover. Contradiction. That's how our contradiction is going. And the reason that this leads to contradiction is because we can keep making that half as small as we want. So we'll eventually fit it into any open set you choose. That makes sense. That's a great picture of how this is going to go. Okay.
So now that we gave all the intuition, let's go over the actual proof. And I mean, it's not that hard of a proof, it's just a lot of notation. I think you can see why with the picture. Yeah. So let's get started. So we're going to prove that every closed and bounded interval, A, B, is compact in R with the standard topology. So let A, B be a subset of R and let O be any open cover of it. Assume by way of contradiction that no finite subcover of O exists. We're going to denote AB as A1 to B1, and we're going to consider the halves of that interval. This half and this half. Mm -hmm. Then, for one of, I think I meant to say these, then for one of these half intervals, there must not exist a finite subcover of O for all. No, take out the four. Just a subcover of O. Call it this. Right? Oh. <laughs> then for one of these half intervals, for one of these two half intervals, there must not exist a finite subcover of O for it, comma, call that half A2, B2. That's what I'm saying here. Okay. Let A2, B2 be the half that doesn't have a finite subcover. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I don't know what I was thinking when I wrote that sentence. Similarly, define A3, B3 to be the half of A2, B2 with no finite subcover. Mm -hmm. And either of those halves can be, right? It's not just one has to. One, one has to be one infinite. Has to be infinite. But both of them can. Both of them can. Okay. One has to be infinite. Pick the half that is for sure infinite. Mm -hmm. Okay. Similarly with A3, B3, in general, let A and A10 plus 1, B10 plus 1 be the half of A and B n with no finite subcover. And note that it's always going to be a subset. Because we're picking half of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. In other words, notice that these I just barely created nested intervals. Yeah. Okay. Now consider the set of all our intervals and observe that for any positive integer, the length of the nth interval is b minus a over 2 to the n minus 1. Yeah. And that. A and B n has no finite subcover. Mm -hmm. Right? Because it's always a half that didn't have a finite subcover. Yeah. And that's true for all n of them. Okay, wonderful. Now, I know from the previous theorem that there exists some little x such that little x is in the intersection of all those closed intervals. Right? Because mm -hmm. yeah. it can't be empty. And I know that there exists some u in O such that x is in u. O is an open cover. It better have some open set u that contains x. If it covers a whole interval, then there better be an open set in there that contains our little x. Mm -hmm. yeah. That makes sense? Okay. Uh, since u is open, then there must exist some open ball centered at x that's still a subset of u. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good? Okay, and for some epsilon that's a positive number, all we know is that epsilon is a positive number, probably a really, 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 really small positive number, but still some positive number. Yeah. Good? Okay, now we're going to use the Archimedean principle. I know that then there exists some positive integer such that 1 over that positive integer is smaller than any positive number you pick. You pick any small positive number you want. Yes. Notice b minus a is positive, right? Yeah. And epsilon is positive by, de by definition, right? Yeah. So a positive divided by a positive is positive. still just a positive number. And for any positive number you choose, I can find such a massive positive integer such that 1 divided by that positive integer is less than your positive number. Yeah. That makes sense? That's just the Archimedean principle. Yes. 
And notice that this being true, don't multiply both sides by b minus a means that this is true. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Okay. Now notice that for any positive integer, n, n is less than 2 to the n. Yeah. 1 is less than 2 to the 1. 2 is less than 2 to the 2. 3 is less than 2 to the 3. 100 is less than 2 to the 100. Yeah. Okay. Right? So since n is less than 2 to the n, then when, if, instead of dividing b minus a by n, I divide b minus a by 2 to the n, I made it way smaller than it was before, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So if b minus a over m was less than epsilon, p minus a over 2 to the n is definitely less than epsilon. That's a way smaller number. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Okay. So... I just realized I wrote minus when I should have wrote plus here. It's plus. That is plus. That is plus, 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 um, plus, plus, and we're good. Okay. So we're good that this number is less than epsilon. Right? Then, since x is in a sub n plus 1 and b sub n plus 1, right? Yeah. x is in everything. Yes. Oh, that's right. Yep. So here's what we're going to have. I have x, and I know that it is inside this closed interval a sub n plus 1, b sub n plus 1, right? Yeah. But I also know that x is inside this open ball x minus epsilon, which is going to be clear out here, x plus epsilon, which is going to be clear out here. Okay. And notice that this closed interval is now completely inside of this open ball, which is a subset of u. Yeah. Which gives me this closed interval being contained by one set. Which Contradiction, because it should take infinitely many. Mm -hmm. So that's where we're going with this. So since x is in there, and since the length of this interval is less than epsilon, since this interval is less than epsilon, and x is in there, then x plus epsilon is going to be outside that interval to the right, and x minus epsilon is going to be outside that interval to the left. So since the length of the interval is less than epsilon, then the whole interval is going to be a subset of x minus epsilon, x plus epsilon. Yeah, all came down to the Archimedean property. That's a common thing with the uh, capsules type groups. Uh, so then that interval, since it's a subset of this open ball, and the open ball is a subset of u, then that interval is a subset of u. And u is just one element in O. Yeah. So then the set containing u by itself is a cover for that interval. Contradiction. Because it should have to take infinitely many. Right. Therefore, O has a finite self cover. <laughs> and so, AB is in fact an R. They are the silliest proofs I know. <laughs> these, hopefully, these are working like I want. I know now that you go back and watch the lectures, but the camera gets real shaky and it drives me nuts. Why? I don't know. I think it just gets vibrations from like walking around or I know they were doing construction out there one time. And so driving their trucks was probably shaking it. I don't know. All I know is it's really bad shaking and it drives me nuts. And that helps? I don't know. I think so. I think I tried it once and it helped. Go watch it and let me know. Compare this week's lecture to last week's lecture as you're re-watching them. To prepare yourself for the last lecture, next week's our last class, so you got to be prepared for that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so a quick corollary of what we just proved is that in Rn, any cross-section of closed-bounded intervals is still going to be compact. And we proved that. We proved the base case. This would now be proved by induction. Yep. Yeah, just like that one. Just like that one. Okay. 
Well, it, it would be using this and it would be using uh, our cross product one. X cross Y. Yeah, X cross Y. Yeah. So I know that this is compact and I know that this is compact, therefore their cross product is compact. Mm -hmm. So combining this and combining the other one, you basically have this for free. All right, let's do our very last theorem and then we'll be done for today, which doesn't quite finish the section, but it's a good enough place to stop. Can you say the next part of this is all the examples? Yeah, so I'll be finishing the serum. Next week, we'll start with a bunch of examples, which will hopefully re-trigger you about the theorem we proved. Okay. okay. If I remember the book right. Anyways, so let's prove this. So let Rn with the standard topology, oh, with the standard metric, sorry. Let Rn with the standard metric D the standard metric in Rn is just the Euclidean metric. As we know. Yeah, Pythagorean theorem. Okay. Distance. That's what we're talking about. So let Rn with the standard metric D and standard topology, which you inherit from the standard metric. Then A as a subset of Rn is compact if and only if it's closed and bounded. Oh, so this is what you've been kind of referring to. Then. Yep, this is what we were working our whole way up to, this proof. So, inside of the standard topology in calculus, closed bounded sets and uh, compact sets are the exact same thing. That's what we're going to prove. So, one. Uh, well, we'll do whichever way this way is first. One. Uh, assume. A is compact. Okay, so now I need to show that A is closed and A is bounded. Okay. Okay? Now, we're back to the first set that we did. Oh. <laughs> well, let's point out one more thing again. Uh, you might remember the proof that every metric space is housed door. Yeah. I do remember that. And the way that you do that is you just, just take half the distance between the points. If I have this distance, if I have those two points, there's some distance between them. Right? Mm -hmm. Some distance D. Pick half the distance and then create the open balls with half the distance. There's your disjoint open sets contained. That's how you do it. So, our theorem clear over here, 7.8, was if X is Hal's door and A is a subset of X that's compact, then it's closed. So we need to show R to the N is house door? We already know it's house door. It's a metric space. Yeah. Every metric space is house door. That's a proof that we already did. That's why I was just drawing here. So the first part's given. Yeah. So we already, from our first theorem that we proved today, we know that A is closed. closed. We don't know that it's <laughs> Observe that A is closed. By what number is that? 7.8. 7. 7. 7. First thing we did today. Now we need to show that A is bounded. I need to show that you can find some big number M such that all the points. Well, here, let me pick a point first and we'll say it. 3. Let A1, A2, dot, 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 AN be some point in big A. Notice A is in Rn, so we need n coordinates to signify that point. If we're only in two dimensional space, then it's just your x and your y coordinate. Yeah. Right? Okay. So, what does it mean for A to be bounded? It means that all the points in A are within some distance of this point. Mm -hmm. Within one point? Yeah. Within that. And then you're done. Any point. It means that the distance between any two points is finitely big. You can't find two points where the distance between them is infinite. So I need to show that for any two points you choose, the distance between them is finite. Okay? So I need to find some big M such that every point in A is within M of this point, and we're done. Good? 
And I'm going to say equal to little a in a, just so that I can use this to start referencing that point instead of rewriting it out like that. Good? Mm -hmm. Okay, four. Then, the set of all open balls using our metric centered at a with distance n for all n in the positive integers is an open cover of a. In other words, I'm taking the open ball with radius 1, centered at a, then the open ball with radius 2, then the open ball with radius 3, then with radius 4, then with radius 5, then with radius 6. Yeah. When I do this to infinity, I cover all of x, which means I for sure cover a. Because I eventually get every point, right? Okay, so then I need to name this set, or then O equal to that is an open cover of A, which gives me, we won't end it there, we'll just do, which implies O has a finite subcover. with largest ball, call it B sub D A M. Right? So this is just a sequence of open balls getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And if we have finitely many of those open balls, then we can just take the biggest one in our finite set. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So I'm just saying, let this be the biggest ball in our finite subcover of this. Okay. You good? All right. Then A is bounded by M. Then A is bounded, we're done. Or maybe then A is a subset of that ball. To really bring it home. Which gives me A is bounded. All the points in A are within 2M of each other. Yeah. Good? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we just really showed that if it's compact, then it's closed and bounded. Now let's go the other way. 6. Assume A is closed and bounded. Okay, since it's closed and bounded, then there has to be some big number m such that, let me say it this way. Let me write it first because it's hard to put in words without the picture. So, then there exists big M. Big M is just what we typically use to, for a really big number that we're bounded by. Then there exists some really big positive number m such that, uh, A sorry assume A is closed and bounded comma and we need to still grab some point there and let A equal to A1 A2 all the way up to AN and big A grab some point in there since we know it's bounded, then we know that there's going to be some big M I can find such that all of A is within big M of that little a. Or in other words, so that A is a subset of A1 minus M to A1 plus M cross A2 minus M, A2 plus M cross dot 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 cross a n minus m a n plus m do you follow that one which is compact or is that one weird yes no i think i follow all right yeah let's just i didn't name that stupid thing and i'm not rewriting it which is equal to b okay 
So, eight. Observe that B is compact, just like what you said, comma, and has A as a closed subset, which gives us A as compact. And this is why I was referencing right at the start of class the theorem that we were going to use, but that was the last thing we were going to need, so we wait. Last week, the last thing that we proved last week was that if you have a set A as a subset of a compact set B where A is closed, then it's also compact. A closed subset of a compact set is also compact. That's the way to say it. Okay. So since A is closed, and since it's a subset of a compact set B, then it is also compact. And that's it. That's the end. Yeah, I think we got through the roughest part of chapter 7 today. So... Heard in that. Ah, so yeah, we got the same point here. Yep, so we'll just have a bunch of examples. Two more theorems. And then 7.3, which I guess has a bit of stuff in it, but not much. So yeah, I think we'll be able to finish next week, no problem. Uh, remind people that they need to show up for the start of class.